evening. Our first song uh, begins with the words, Hark, tis the shepherd's voice I hear. And before Mr. Jones puts it up there, uh, you know what the title of that song might be? What? Hark, tis the shepherd's voice I hear. Bring them in. All right, let's stand together and uh, think about and uh, sing about bringing them in. please. be seated. Uh, this week's Missionary Spotlight is on Mrs. Laverne Waugh. We have supported her, oh, for a good, good many years. Her and her husband have served faithfully in the country of Zimbabwe. He went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago, um, but uh, just a We've got a new letter from her. It's posted out in the, out in the foyer. Just wanted to share a couple things from it. Um, that song talking about bring them in and, and the fields. And when I think about the, the weather and their needs, she says one of their prayer requests is, is to pray for good rains and good harvest this year. Pastor shared that a couple weeks ago, I think, as the agrarian society that we in this area are not quite used to. We're not, we don't depend mentally on that rain. We just, oh yeah, it rained. Oh yeah, it didn't rain. Okay, sure. But pray specifically for the rains. And while the soil may be dry, the desert may be real, but souls for the harvest. She says the people of Zimbabwe are very open to the gospel, and we have folks in many different areas asking for pastors to come and plant churches for them in their areas. So they are faced with the delightful challenge of spreading themselves over new areas to meet the needs and get new works planted and grounded in the scriptures. So starting new works, but also growing those new works and seeing them established firmly in the truth of the gospel, which brings us to the Bible school that has been started over there. We praise the Lord that there's been 30 men who have felt the Lord's call in their lives to preach. They have now completed their first year's training in the Stuart Wall Pastors Training School, and they have two more years to go. And then those men can be sent out to either start new works or to help assist in other established works or growing works. But also she mentions the economy in Zimbabwe. If you know anything about the, the list of countries in the world, Zimbabwe is dreadfully low on the list. So be praying for the supply for her and the people there and just the fact that they live day to day um, in, in, in every way. Um, many of you probably know that uh, Russ and Phyllis Dethridge were able to take a trip last month. And as part of that trip, they were able to visit Mrs. Waugh and 
Russ was able to send a video. I'm going to ask Dave to show that in just a few seconds, but um, I wanted to share a couple lines from a letter that Russ sent, and he said, so I'll just quote from Russ. First, let me say that our time with Sister Laverne was the highlight of their trip. And if you're on Facebook and you saw some of the pictures and saw some of the things that a once-in-a-lifetime trip would include, that's the highlight, he says. The time spent with her, the fellowship was sweet and was a great encouragement. Um, they had a great time with the group they were with. They were able to share and, and learn more about the work. Um, he describes some of the difficulties that, that have been going on. And she says that, he says in classic Laverne fashion, she says, it's all right, I can get by. I can tighten my belt a little and I'll be just fine. Knowing that God will continue to provide for her. God will take care of her needs. God will take care of the needs of the people that she's ministering with and to. Um, and so Russ also says, of all the wonders of Africa that we saw, Sister Laverne Wall was the greatest wonder of them all, and we can't express enough how blessed we were to have spent the short amount of time with her. And he says, give our best to the church. Dave, if you could show that video, and then we'll pray. The Baptist Church, Russ and Phyllis Dethridge, here in Iganyana Tent Camp, Zimbabwe. And I'm sure you recognize this wonderful lady in front of the camera. She would like to say a brief message to you all there. Hi, my precious friends at Calvary. I have just had such a wonderful time with these two precious people. They have been just special, special, and we've had sweet, sweet fellowship. So thank you for letting them come out. And I do want to thank you also for all you mean to me and to our ministry here and have been over the years. I was just telling them that the time when Simon died, all those many years ago, nearly 30 years ago now, and uh, Stuart and I were so broken, he died suddenly, as some of you will remember. And when we went to the States shortly after um, his death, the first church we visited was you. And I will never forget how, what a comfort and how much you embraced us and helped us and carried us through those first months of early grief and Ever since then, you've had such a special place in my heart. But um, back to the present day, it's been wonderful to have these folk. They're here in the bush with us, watching elephants and impalas and all sorts of creatures. We've had such a precious time together, and um, I know when they come back, they'll have stories to tell you. But I will miss them, and I'm trying to exact a promise from them to come back again. So... <laughs> But lots and lots of love to you all, and my grateful thanks. And I do pray for you, and I know you pray for me and for the ministry here. And I thank you deeply. God bless you all. Good night from beautiful Zimbabwe, Africa. I, th I think that video is about one week old, so it's pretty fresh. Um, in a few minutes, we'll have an update from Brother Pat Delaney. I just wanted to point out that he's going to give us an update, but uh, he'll share with us from a trip that he took earlier in the fall, and hopefully we'll see more missionary faces, missionary realities, what his ministry to them is and what some of their ministries are as well. But we'll also have an update next Sunday evening. The plan is for uh, Brother Steve Anderson to give us an update as well. So we're looking forward to both of those. And uh, just remember... Remember, Brother Steve, in your prayers for his continued recovery. Let's pray tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to partner with Mrs. Waugh and uh, Stuart over so many years of faithful ministry. Lord, thank you for uh, their lives of service, uh, the, the dedication to you and your word and your churches, Lord, that as the gospel goes forth, we can see them established. Lord, we ask that you'd provide and provide protection, but also provision. Um, thank you for the the training school there in Zimbabwe, we ask that as these men are trained, that we would hear of more churches being established throughout that country and even further in Africa, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the men that have been raised up over the last many years to, to lead churches. We thank you for them. Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with Brother Steve Anderson as he continues to heal. Just give him strength. Lord, help us to remember our missionaries and remember the works that you have established and that you've allowed them to be involved in and allowed us to partner with. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, welcome this evening here, and it's good to start off with uh, just a reminder, some of our missionaries and the opportunity that we have uh, to be able to see their work uh, all around the world and to be connected. I'm glad that we've got modern technology where, like, um, even sometimes it may not work exactly like we like it to, but we can be able to be connected, and they can see us, and we can see them at times, and, um, uh, and, and connect us from around the world as we hold their hands. So a couple um, cards I want to read. Thank you so much, uh, dear Pastor Amber and Calvary Baptist Church, for the gift basket from uh, Harry and Dave's, David's. Uh, we are also thankful for you, your faithfulness and prayers, cards, and phone calls. God is so good in his love, Steve and Martha, for Samuel 12, 24. And then, dear pastor and uh, church family, thank you so much for all the prayers, texts, emails, gorgeous flowers sent during the recent homegoing of my mom. It is a huge encouragement to have the support and love of so many during this difficult time. Our family is so blessed to be a part of a loving church. Sincerely, Sharon, Kobe, Ria, and Adelaide, and Watson. And so these are some thank you cards from them. also want to mention some opportunities that we have uh, that are coming up here. Uh, Easter is at the end of this month. And so what we would like to do is we'd like to take uh, three Saturdays in March and we have some door hangers. You saw the picture in the announcement there on the, on the board at the beginning of the service. And we're going to take a couple of neighborhoods uh, down on 53 here, the Burwell neighborhood, and at the end of Indian Creek here. And we're going to take those on Saturdays between 10 and 12 over the next uh, couple Saturdays. If you want to meet here at the church and grab a few of those and, um, and uh, go with a group, uh, we'd like to do that over the next few weeks and give us an opportunity also, we have one of these baskets that we've, uh, we've put. Several people have put these together for us. There's just some goodies, uh, water, a couple water bottles, and some um, uh, snacks that are in here. We have them on a table in the, lob, in, the, um, in the library, and each one of them has a sticky note on it with a, with a street name. I uh, can't remember what the street is specifically. It's Tormore or something like that. Terramore. Terramore is the first road that we're going to hit there. It's the closest to the, um, the homes that, are, that have been built there. And then there is a, a house number on that. And uh, if you can just grab, we've got 10 of those ready right now that can go over. We'll put, um, put 10 more on the table uh, this next week when they're taken. If you could just take a couple, take them by, knock on the door some, sometime and, and introduce yourself. Tell them you're from uh, Calvary Baptist Church across the street. Just want to say welcome to the neighborhood, and this is a gift from our church, and we'd love to see them come to church if they don't have a church home. If they're not home, you can leave it at the door. It's got a card on the inside, just the message from our church. And this is an opportunity that um, we'll be able to do. There's a, we'll put a map on the table so that you'll be able to see, but the map that we have printed off uh, has it by lot number, not by house number. The lot's as they've sold and uh, is not actually the number that is on the house. So we went over there, wrote the numbers on the house. So the map shows you kind of where it is, but you kind of have to just um, see where. And it may not show up on uh, MapQuest either just right yet because some of these people have just moved in in the last four weeks or so. So I'd like for you to take that opportunity and you pray about it and um, give some opportunity this spring for us to be involved in that way. Tuesday night, we have a service, not Wednesday night. Appalachian Bible College is going to be here for a service at 7 o'clock. And uh, the Calvary Baptist Academy Senior Fundraiser Meal, 5.30 to 6.15 in the gym. If you'd like to participate in that, you can come from work, come to eat. Uh, the tickets uh, are, are there. And so just to remind you about that, daylight savings time this weekend. So Saturday we'll be changing our, uh, we lose an hour, I believe, uh, this weekend. And so um, uh, make sure you, you remind yourself about that, put it in there. On March 10th, uh, the gyms have a luncheon uh, after the AM service. There's a sign up on the bulletin board. If you could sign up today if you're interested in that so they can have uh, preparation for that. Uh, there's, I believe it's a barbecue meal, and uh, so March 10th, and um, the gyms have a luncheon after the AM service, remind you about that, and on March 14th, it's a couple weeks away, it's a Thursday night, we have a couple's bowling activity at the Stars and Strikes, we've rented the section on the back portion of um, the Stars and Strikes, it's $25, 
uh, 7 o'clock over there at 6.30. You can bring your kids here to the church for babysitting. There's a sign-up on the bulletin board so that we can prepare uh, for that as well. March 17th, that would uh, be the Sunday night after that, a few Sundays away, uh, is our first hospitality night for the year. And uh, we've contacted all of hosts, and the hosts should be contacting each one. We'll have um, uh, the list up on the bulletin board next Sunday. And uh, um, so host, if you know, um, would you make sure that you contact those who are on your list? And if you'd like to participate and you're not on the list, you've not been called, or, um, or maybe when we post the names up and, and you like to participate for that evening, uh, we've got a couple locations that we can put you in if you'll just see some of the ladies in the office or my wife or myself about that. All right, those are a few of the announcements that are kind of going on. And uh, we're going to sing a couple songs back to back, just focusing our attention upon giving our life to the Lord and being faithful. And so this first song, I want to be faithful. And the next one is take my life and let it be as a prayer tonight, both in, um, in what we're going to hear and what we've already heard with Ms. Mrs. Wall. Let's go ahead and stand, if you would, please. Uh, we'll sing both of these uh, back to back and uh, trust that uh, we realize we're speaking to uh, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with uh, grace in our hearts to the Lord. So uh, we're doing what the New Testament early church did. Let's uh, look forward to enjoying that as we sing in these days. that up with uh, take my life and let it be.
chorus of voices on this third verse. Here we go. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from me. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold, not a mite would I withhold. Everyone, everything on verse 4. Take my seated. The end of last year, um, Brother and Mrs. Delaney had an opportunity to go uh, out west, way west, actually probably east. <laughs> if you want to, um, you know, she's sharing with some pictures after the service one day when they were back, first of the year, and I said, "You need to, you need to share your trip with our church and what God did uh, with, uh, with with with." what you saw and the missionaries that you were able to see who we support and uh, the opportunity that they were given. So um, we're going to have him come, and I think Miss Mary's going to say a little something too, and then he's going to close uh, with um, uh, some scripture tonight and give us a challenge tonight. So Brother Delaney, you come. Well, good evening, and thank you, Pastor Cochran, for uh, this opportunity. I appreciate you availing your pulpit to both Mary and me. Thank you, Brother David, for approaching us uh, a month or so back and uh, making all these arrangements. We're very, very grateful to stand up here and share with you uh, really a report on what, what 
faithful servants of the Lord Jesus for Baptist World Mission are busy doing in their part of God's vineyard. But um, we'll get right into the presentation here. On November 7th, Mary and I embarked upon a four-week field visit that took us to three different countries to visit three different missionary families. Those countries you see on the screen, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines. Tell you a little bit about that trip. We'll take you on that journey. Initially, we flew, and there you see, from Nashville to San Francisco in the morning. And then late that evening, we departed San Francisco and flew through the night 15 hours to Manila in the Philippines. Over, uh, spent an overnight there, an 18 hour break in the trip, and flew on to Brisbane, Australia for another overnight and another uh, 22 hour break in that trip, and then boarded our flight finally to Haniara, getting there on November 11th. So from November 7th to the 11th. Where are the Solomons? Well, if you go to Papua New Guinea and you go to the east, you'll find the Solomon Islands. It's an archipelago of which the main island is Guadalcanal. You'll hear a little bit more about that. And that's the home of the capital of the Solomons called Honiara. There in Honiara are Michael and Nora Dietrich. They began serving the Lord and the Solomons in 2018. Today they have four children, only three of which are seen in the slide. But the names of their children are Corbin, Kezia, Michelle, and Lily. And I can say that Michael is doing an outstanding job planting the Pacific Light Baptist Church and ministering in that native tongue called Pigeon. When we were there with the Dietrichs, their congregation at that time in November was meeting in the living room of their home. Since then, they've moved out, first of all, to a YWCA, and now they're into a rental property. And this past week, I approved a $12,000 special project to renovate that rental property. But here you can see half of that morning congregation. And since our visit, uh, they are well on their way in this precious church plant. Joseph is their song leader, and he's a godly influence. He's a taxi driver and a member of their church. Oh, how we love listening to the singing of their precious congregation. Let's tune in if we can. You get a feel for it that way. But the Pacific Games were one week away from opening in Haniara on the Solomon Islands. What are the Pacific Games? Well, they're games like the Olympic Games meant for the countries of Oceania. The Asian Games are meant for the countries of Asia. The World Games are meant for countries of the world. These are all on four-year cycles. But the Pacific Games were to take place a week after we were there, and Michael arranged for the distribution of 25,000 copies of John Romans. And with each of those John Romans, there was a church flyer tucked inside containing the gospel, as well as a QR code that they could go to their church's website. And the first 100 responders to Michael were given a free Bible and a private one-on-one -on -one Bible study. So these people, as they prepared for that tremendous outreach event, truly demonstrated a mind to work, just like in Nehemiah's day. And I cannot emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, as I stand before you tonight, the essential need of a field administrator to travel with his wife. This entire trip, I tell people everywhere I go, would have been a disaster without Mary's presence. You know, children can tell when you love them. And MKs are certainly at the top of that list. You know, the missionary wives welcomed an extra pair of hands to clean up the kitchen and do the dishes, wash their clothes by hand, cook a meal, lend a listening heart, as well as an open ear. And that's the ministry of Mary Delaney, as she is my shadow. But how could we go to the Solomon Islands and not spend some time enjoying the beauty of the ocean? 
For missionaries who serve in the islands, a day off is like a day down by the sea. Nothing rejuvenates a soul more than some sand and surf and lots of sunshine. And by the way, it's a great way to wear out small children as well. But it was in this place, the Ricana Flourish Lodge, that Mary and I stayed during our one-week visit with the Dietrichs. It was a modest place, no air conditioning, but yet very comfortable. It took my wife and I back to our roots when we first got to Asia some 35-plus years ago, and we felt right at home. This is Red Beach in the next slide. On August 7, 1942, the 1st Marine Division began landing on this very shore. Together with the landing at Blue Beach in Tulagi, 25 miles opposite this spot, this signaled the first American offensive during World War II. The first step on that long road to Tokyo took place right here. On February 9, 1945, the Japanese finally evacuated Guadalcanal after losing 21,000 soldiers, sailors, and airmen in that struggle. The U.S. lost 7,000 men acquiring that great victory. Here's a monument to the Battle of Bloody Ridge. If in the hard-fought fight the ridge had fallen, Henderson Field and Fighter One Airstrip would have been lost, and with them, Guadalcanal. But after six fine days spent in the Solomons, it was time to move on in our journey. The next step was Papua New Guinea. It was in the Eastern Highlands province where Mary and I returned after our first visit seven years before. To get there is a tremendous challenge. Initially, you fly into the city of Port Moresby, the capital on the southern coastline, and from there you take a domestic flight up into the Eastern Highlands province, city of Goroka. Thanks for pointing that out. You folks are tremendous back there. But from there, you take a challenging three-hour overland off-road journey on some of the most rugged roads, rutted out, you've ever been on in your life. This is the home that Ben built in the next slide. In 2012, Ben Childs built this two-story home with his bare hands. He literally cut a 200-year-old eucalyptus tree by himself, milled the lumber with a portable mill, ran the plumbing from a nearby mountain stream, and we've been to the source, and set up the electricity with those solar panels you see on the top of his roof. Ben Childs is a modern-day Renaissance man. He's the most brilliant missionary I've ever had the privilege of knowing. Just like the church, just like the home, Ben built the church with his own hands. They've been using this built building for the past seven years. It's called Gutnius Baptist Sios. That's pigeon for Good News Baptist Church. This is a little bit slow for me. I'm trying to get there. Hold on. Mine's hung up now. There we go. While visiting the Childs, we stayed in that guest room. You see the stairs going up to the door. It's connected to the side of their church building. And then those two slide pictures to the left of that was a little modest outhouse they built for our use while we were there. We're grateful for that. Ben and Lauren Childs have three grown daughters Abigail, Miriam, Chloe, they're on their way to Bible college. Two of the oldest are on the way to Bible college this fall, by the way, so pray for them. But here they're standing, the child's family, with Tom and Mare. And, their plan, and since we were there, Brother Tom has been installed as the first national pastor of Good News Baptist Church. As you look around the child's compound, you'll find the cookhouse, that's that thatched roof building at the top, a gazebo to the right where villagers come to get medicine whenever needed, and outdoor Bible studies are conducted. Bottom left is where their Sunday school takes place, and on the bottom right is a sports ground. There you see volleyball, but they also have a place for basketball. But the roads, as I mentioned earlier, around Papua New Guinea's Highland Province are extremely treacherous. 
This Toyota Land Cruiser is owned by uh, Ben and it's fully outfitted, tricked out uh, to the maximum degree. But when, but Ben Childs knows those roads like the back of his hand and I'm so thankful for his skill and experience in navigating them. Brother Ben Childs is a man passionately committed to and wholly given over to the ministry. He spent the first seven years of his life as a missionary kid there in Papua New Guinea, different location. At the age of seven, his parents left Papua New Guinea and went to Perth, Australia. We're going back 40 years ago now because of health-related issues. So Ben spent his later youth and teenage years in Perth, Australia, and then went to Ambassador Baptist College, got married, graduated, and went back to his childhood home of Papua New Guinea as a God-called church planter. Here you see a sample of the teaching materials that Ben has translated in order to disciple his people. Church planting, ladies and gentlemen, involves training nationals to take leadership inside that local church. Here's Brother Tom, the national pastor, who Ben has been training over the past 13 years. And whether it's preaching, like in that open air market at 8 a.m. on Monday mornings, or from the pulpit of Good News Baptist Church, Brother Tom passionately desires to serve his Savior. One day, Mary and I trekked up the mountainside to visit various church members in their home area inside the village. Now, Ben's church in Titicave Village sets at 4,500 feet elevation. We trekked another 500 feet up to reach these homes that you see in the pictures here. It is paradise, believe me. We had the joy of visiting the home of Brother Tom and Mare, just like Ben. Ben trained Tom, and Tom built this home with his own hands. They had three children. Their little boy, Charlie, died a year ago. He's buried beneath this home. Five years ago, or excuse me, five times a year, the Childs dedicate an entire day from 8 in the morning to 10 at night butchering chickens. We butchered 25 on this day. Chickens are the primary form of meat for the child's family, and at the end of the day, the church members are entitled to a good meal for helping them with this big project. Ben and Lauren asked that we would extend our stay to be with them and celebrate Thanksgiving there in Papua New Guinea. It was a traditional Thanksgiving feast, just as you see in the pictures, but with chicken. Our next stop was Naga, Philippines, where we stayed the next week with veteran missionaries Kevin and Mary Bruner. They've more recently moved into that newer home that you see to the right. For nearly 25 years, Kevin and Mary have lived in the town of Naga, or Pili, two little towns side by side, located in the southeast of, or southeast of Manila, and it's one hour domestic flight from Manila to Naga in the province of Kamenin Sur. This is part of the Bicol region there in the Philippines. For the past 20 years, Kevin has been the missionary pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, you see on the slide, in the town of Pili. And this is the ministry that was started over 30 years ago by veteran retired missionary Jim Spears. Now they're getting ready to have their first national pastor, Kevin is preparing Richard, as you see in the slide, to become that pastor. I had the joy with Kevin of visiting Richard in his home, just a thatch-roofed little house out in a rice paddy field with a dirt floor. Kevin and Mary give significant amount of time to teaching values education in a village elementary school in a little town called Pagasa. And it's in this little village that the Bruners intend to plant their next church, which will be their second church plant in their 25 years in the Philippines. You know, reaching people, ladies and gentlemen, involves going out into the countryside, the highways and byways, 
where people are living, confronting them lovingly with their need of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I can honestly say there are none better at doing that than Kevin and Mary Bruner. You'll never find another missionary couple more wholly given over to the ministry than the Bruners. For as long as I've known them, Kevin and Mary have maintained an incredibly demanding schedule. They will drive you into the ground. But they are the epitome of sacrificial devotion to Jesus Christ. So there you have it. The Bible says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We need more Dietrichs, more Childs, more Bruners. And as the days pass, as the sun is setting, what about you? Is God calling you into his harvest? May he do that for his glory. I'm going to turn the time now to my wife. She'll stand there. She has a mic. She'll share and show things to you, and then I'll come back. I don't, is it, okay, it's on. I don't. I never learned how to do PowerPoint presentations. I'm going to come up here so I can see everyone. Um, in elementary education, we weren't doing PowerPoints. We didn't even have computers back in those days. But if I were to do a PowerPoint presentation, of course, it would be a little bit different. Uh, one thing I just want to say, my husband said we, we overnighted in those countries. No, we didn't. We were in the plane through the night. And then we were in those countries for a few hours in the day waiting for our next night flight. So we basically missed three nights of sleep. Um, we had to leave for the airport at 3.30 in Nashville and then over to uh, San Francisco. Then we were awake for the day visiting friends and um, uh, the uh, Anyway, then we overnight to Manila, 15 hours. And then we're awake through the day in Manila, waiting for our overnight flight to Sydney. So by the time we ended up getting to Solomon Islands, we were, we were really exhausted. Um, it's, it, it was a long trip. But um, very, and I think one thing that made this challenging is the four weeks that we were gone, or four and a half weeks, there were very, very few people that actually spoke English. And so your brain just gets tired I, I hope you'll think about that when you run into people from other countries here in the grocery store or out and about. When people are coming from Japan into our community for Toyota Mazda or when they're coming into our community for whatever reason, it gets tiring being surrounded by a language that you don't speak. Um, and we, were also, we also had very limited Wi-Fi while we were gone, which... You know, we don't have to have access to our phones, but it made it a little bit unnerving knowing my mother's pacemaker was, was kind of dying. So she was scheduled for a new pacemaker to be put in, and, and we had some other things going on. So it was a little bit unnerving knowing that we were completely unplugged from family if they needed to contact us. We were kind of not able to be uh, contacted there for, for many days. But uh, I would say the first visit to... Uh, I just want to mention Nora and uh, Michael Dietrich. That's where we did get to see uh, the Lees. And sorry, this is in Papua New Guinea, but if you can go to the next couple, three slides. We got, okay, there is the Lees. We support the Lees here. And they had just gotten there the week before we got there. And there's Dougie. Uh, he is just a big personality. He's just, he's perfect for the islands. He's just got, he's not afraid of the water, the ocean, the, the bugs, the frogs. I mean, the, the cockroaches, just bring it on. And he's got a big personality, just like his daddy. And then little um, George was in the hammock when we went to the ocean that one day. And just uh, a happy, happy little baby. But if you can imagine, I'll just, Nora Dietrich. Nora, by the way, went to school with uh, Tim Morand. Can you imagine? They were in Christian school together. And she lost her mother to pancreatic cancer very unexpectedly a couple years ago. So she's got a new baby. She's got four little children. And she has no mother supporting her, encouraging her from America. Um, she was incredible. She's hosting this new missionary family. We had no water our first three days there. So here is, uh, oh, my, I'm blanking. What's her name? Lee. Um, Melody. Melody, thank you. 
we had no water for the first three days, so we were hand washing using these just these containers. And Melody had brought some of that special soap. We were just washing and washing and washing clothes by hand, just scrubbing and scrubbing, and then rinsing in another tub, and then hanging them all out to dry um, because they had gotten so much rain that the turbidity in the water that the, the island had to shut down the main water system. Um, so we had no water the first three days, and th that was crazy. But Nora, imagine, she's hosting a new missionary family. She's hosting a pregnant young lady from the Solomon Islands, um, trying to encourage that young lady um, in an unwed pregnancy. Uh, the heat and humidity was just off the charts, right? Uh, cockroaches in the home, rats in the home, mold and mildew in the home. You walk outside their property, you're going to be covered with grass seeds. I mean, thousands, not hundreds, thousands of grass seeds. And so she, and it hurts. They, they just poke right through your clothes. And so every night, you know, you've got to pull, pull all those grass seeds out of your clothes. And, and, um, and sh they, uh, uh, no air conditioning in their car. They were waiting for their new vehicle to be, to come out of the, the shipping container or whatever. It was kind of caught up in all the red tape. But um, um, this lady, I never heard her complain. She was cooking and cooking, and, and she cooks for the church people Sunday mornings. She's so patient. She's so gracious. I, I just watched in awe. I never saw her blow up or lose her temper with, and she's got a little nursing baby. I mean, Nora, I mean, they are just a wonderful family. And Michael Dietrich, by the way, it was his brother that candidated for our church before um, Pastor Cochran came. Um, just a wonderful couple, and they were such an encouragement to us. And by the way, that little trip to the ocean, the Solomon Islands is absolutely stunning with its beauty, but there's piles of garbage everywhere. There, there, um, there's a lot of poverty. And so you go to the ocean and you see the dolphins just jumping in the water. And you think, this is so beautiful. But it's not, I mean, you've also got piles of garbage all over the place. So that was a little bit sad. But the people were just absolutely wonderful. Very, very precious. And then when we went to Papua New Guinea, if you back up, um, back to those other, that first slide, when we got to Garoka, there was a mission compound there. And we ran into the Perkins. So the Perkins are living there temporarily while Josh is out in the bush in the highlands building the home for the family. His wife and children are homeschooling and, and they're situated in Garoka in the mission compound for New Tribes Mission. So we met them as soon as we got there. And they are the sweetest kids. Very personable. They acted like we were their long lost relatives just because we said we knew Roger and Sharon Crowder. Oh, that's our grandparents. You know them. They were, they were just the sweetest, sweetest kids. Uh, but the Childs, um, he talks, that outhouse, they had just dug that hole for us before we got there. And they had these wood studs up around it. And they said, okay, that's, that's your restroom while you're here. And it's like, but there's no walls or nothing around. He says, oh, it's in the jungle. No one's going to see a thing. And True enough, there is no electricity out there in the, in the highlands. They have no washing machines and dryers. They have no refrigerators. They have no microwaves. They have no stoves or, or ovens. Uh, they have no watches. They have no clocks. They have, so it's, it's pitch dark. When the sun goes down, it is pitch dark. So we would use a little flashlight to make our way out to that little outhouse. In the, and, and I mean, it's, it's pitch dark. You just hear, hear the hundreds of very unique frogs that live in Papua New Guinea. Um, but again, up in the highlands, these people, there's so much poverty with, um, with none of these appliances, no toys. You go into their homes, their huts, there's no furniture. There are no beds. There are no tables. There are no chairs. Um, it's dirt floor, and they have a fire going because it does get cool in the night and in the morning. Uh, no bikes. It's just, but, and anything you want to eat, you garden. Anything you want to eat, you grow. So that day when we butchered chickens, those people don't have meat. Uh, so this was a special treat for them. They might have meat once every two months, a little bit of meat. But they eat cow cow. They eat, and you can go out into, into your garden and you can pick avocado anytime. You can pick mangoes. You can pick, you can pick uh, uh, passion fruit and tomato fruit and bananas. So you've got that steady 
uh, fruit, all you, can, all you can eat fruit, and you've got vegetables, well, they're sweet potatoes and they're greens. They eat a lot of greens. Um, but if you can't grow it, you're not going to eat it. Uh, and what, if they need cash, they go and pan a little bit of gold from the river, or they sell some coca or some coffee beans, or they um, sell some of their New Guinea gold. And you can guess what that is. That grows in their gardens too. Uh, but amazing, amazing people who are there at the church compounds four times a week. Tuesdays and Saturdays is a cleaning day for the compound in Papua New Guinea. They come down from the, from the mountaintops and help to clean the whole compound trim and beautiful flowers all over. It's like a botanic garden. Um, Wednesday, or, well, the Sunday, of course, is the church, and they just ring this big, huge cylinder to help because they don't have watches. So they ring the cylinder. It's like a gas cylinder. Is that what you call it? It's metal, and it, they can hear it up in the, way up in the villages, up in the highlands. And they just come down, start making their way down. And then uh, Wednesday, they're there at 8 o'clock in the morning for a Bible study, because after that, they go up to their gardens. Uh, Thursday, they come down in the afternoon for like a, a, like a Bible Institute Bible study. Saturday, they're there for a cleaning day. Can you imagine coming down from the highlands four times a week to church? Four times. They're not distracted with cell phones, with television, with computers, with ball games. They're they're, they're just at the church so often, and just they're so excited to grow. And memor they memorize scripture. They have no distractions, and they are just absolutely precious people. Uh, we think, you, if you go, you say, they're so poor, but in so many ways, they're so rich. They are so content. The joy that they have with nothing, like Pastor was talking about preaching this morning, they don't know what they're missing. And it was just such a joy to be with them. And then the Bruners, again, first day there, we had no power. And the, the poverty that they're working with, um, the uh, walking through the rice paddies to go to the huts where the people live. They have no furniture. The babies' cradles come down from the roofs of the huts, and they just rock them, and they just sleep on mats on the floor. Uh, many of these people that we were with had no shoes even. Um, no, And it was just such a blessing that we were in... You know, we used to be in Taiwan with Luke's family and such a big, huge city with millions of people, and then Singapore, millions of people. But these places were very rural, and uh, the poverty was incredible. But the joy of the believers, the commitment to the local church, the commitment to Bible memory, to the commitment to coming together to pray, it was unlike I think unlike anything I've ever seen in city missions, honestly. And there's just such a contentment, a sweet contentment, even though you think they are so poor, they have so little, but they have such a joy in the Lord. Their wealth is in, in, in their position in Christ. And it was just a, a blessing to be with these missionary families. And pray for Colton and Melody. You know, they're situated now in their new island home, and they, they need to learn the language, Melody especially. And um, I think they're going to... I mean, I'm, I hope you can get over there, visit them, and encourage them. They, they need encouragement. But um, thank you for your support. It was just a, a very tiring trip and um, very inspirational. We were very, very blessed to see the, uh, the character of these missionaries that we were with. Thank you, honey. Appreciate you sharing. We just have a little bit of time left. I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew 28. We'll look at that classic New Testament passage just briefly and focus on two words. Matthew 28, verse 18, we read, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. I want to challenge you tonight to make Christ's authority your priority. Make Christ's authority your priority. In the early 1990s, there was a Christian magazine periodical entitled The Evangelical Missions Quarterly, and an author, Arthur Glasser, shared an interview that he had conducted with a man named Donald McGavern before McGavern went to heaven. 
Don McGavern was a missiologist, a master teacher in missions, culture, considered, quote unquote, the father of the church growth movement in the 1970s out in Fuller Theological Seminary there in California, thorough new, thoroughgoing new evangelical. But he was a founder of the School of Mission. And Arthur Glasser, conducting this interview with Don McGavern, asked a very poignant question. Dr. McGavern, which part of the Great Commission are we most prone to forget? Now, some people might think that Dr. McGavern would say, um, the strategy, meaning making disciples. That isn't what he said. Some might think McGavern would respond, oh, the scope, all nations. That isn't what McGavern said. In a profound response, Donald McGavern replied, the part of the Great Commission that we are most prone to forget is the absolute authority of Jesus Christ. Brethren, without acknowledging and depending upon the authority of Jesus Christ in your and my life, our labor will be in vain. Let me remind you of Psalm 127 verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know, without acknowledging and depending upon the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives, we will lack the spiritual vitality to stay committed during the most difficult times of ministry. Pastor Cochran, my mind goes back to when I first experienced missions as a single young man. I took a year out of seminary, 1984-85, went to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to pastor a little Bible Baptist mission and replace a seminary classmate of mine. The goal was to spend the first month together. He would transition out, I would transition in. But two weeks into my first month, I was stricken with the most acute case of food poisoning. And lo and behold, my seminary classmate said, Brother Pat, my last night here, I'm going to have an all-night church activity. I said, oh, brother, I'm a morning dove. He's a night owl. And so 8 o'clock at night, this all-night activity starts, and by 2 a.m., I said, I'm done. And I went back to lay down. And two wise adults in that ministry, Brother Isaiah Cho and Miss Hung, came to me and said, Pastor Pat, come. We're taking you to a 24-hour clinic. The doctor examined me and said, young man, you are very sick. I said, I know. This has been going on for two weeks. He said, now, when you leave here tonight, all you can take for the next few days is glucose water. And then after that, someone needs to make you some watery rice porridge. After a few more days, they can add a little vegetable. After a few more days, a little bit of fish. After a few more days, a little bit of chicken. But that's how you're going to have to nurse yourself back to health. Well, this all-night activity was to conclude at 5 a.m. when the church members would board that chartered bus and take my seminary classmate to the airport so he could come back to America and finish seminary. But as they filed out of that church building, and I'm laying down there on the floor on a mat staring at a ceiling fan, I said, oh God, if anything is going to be done over this next year, it's going to be totally by your grace and by your power. And I'm so thankful that's exactly what God proceeded to do. You know, too many Christians view the Great Commission as simply a task they're about to accomplish rather than a call to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ in their lives. If you're just simply doing the work of God in your own power, may I suggest you're doing it in your own authority? We need to surrender all. And during Jesus' earthly ministry, he preached several times while standing on a mountainside. We recall the Sermon on the Mount, the Transfiguration, the Olivet Discourse. And here in Matthew 28, Jesus is standing 
on a mountain in Galilee, and he shared this last command with his disciples, and they in turn were to share it with their disciples, and at some point in time, someone shared this command with you. And somewhere along the line, this command moved into the realm of an obligation. May I remind you of the words of Hudson Taylor? The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. And let's be honest, there are times when the obligation of this command can weigh very heavy upon our hearts. You know, I remember when I was first being trained to be a soul winner in the Fisherman's Club, goes back 40 years now, Fellowship Baptist Church in Marshalltown. We'd be trained for three hours on a Saturday morning, then go door to door three hours one night a week. But the first month, I was simply to be the silent partner. My trainer was to do all the talking. But week two into my role as a silent partner, we're approaching the front door of this home, and my trainer turns to me and said, Brother Pat, this one's yours. I, I said, what? What? And my knees started shaking, and I was shivering, and I was praying, God, I pray there's no one at home. But when the lady opened the door, and I told her who I was and who we were, and where we were from and what we were doing, she said, oh, that's wonderful. We belong to such and such a church down the street. And I said, oh, phew. You know, when Jesus offered the Great Commission to his disciples that day, I want you to notice very quickly where Jesus began. Jesus began by offering his authority in verse 18 with those two words, all power. In the Greek, it's pasa exousia, but it denotes executive power. Our president leads our executive branch of government, and when the president first takes over on that inauguration day, he oftentimes executes executive orders that are laws. And Jesus Christ was the disciples' commander-in-chief. And I want us to ponder his authority very quickly. We need to think about what kind of authority it is. Well, it's consequential in its exclusivity and in its transforming power. This authority is consequential. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's exclusivity. It's transforming in its power. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What kind of authority is it? Consequential. How was this authority manifested? Well, think about that garden experience when Judas Iscariot came with his band to arrest the Messiah. John 18 Verses 4 through 6, you listen as I read. John 18, verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. That's the authority that Jesus promises you and I. Is this authority transferable to you and me? Yes. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. You follow along as I read Acts 4, verse 13. The Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness, of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So that's the authority. It has a source embedded in the person of Jesus Christ. But the source of the authority has a history of impact. You know, before Jesus tells you and I to do anything for him, he reminds all of us of what he has done for us. The Gospel of Matthew is a study literally in the authority of Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, 
reveals Jesus had the authority to teach. Matthew 8 reveals Jesus had the authority to heal. Matthew 9 reveals Jesus had the authority to forgive sin. You get to Matthew 10, and it reveals Jesus gave this authority to his apostles so that they might have power over the demonic world. Matthew 10, 1, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. I'll make an application, and we're done. What difference does it make if Jesus Christ has this kind of authority? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus never told us about his authority, all power is given unto me, we would never have the courage to go out to the uttermost part of this earth and reach the lost with a life-transforming gospel to the glory of God. You know, before I went to Singapore with my wife, I'd never started a church from scratch in my life. So why did I go? Because I, I went to Singapore because the Lord promised me his authority in this great commission. You know, before I went to Taiwan with my wife, at the age of 50, I had never gone to language school to study Mandarin Chinese. Honestly, I don't recommend that to anyone anywhere, anytime. But in my case, it was God's will. And it wasn't so much about Pat Delaney. It was about the feet that followed him. Do you think there was a time or two when I got discouraged at that stage of life, learning Mandarin Chinese? Do you think God used that experience to deepen my dependence upon the authority of Jesus Christ in my life? Dear friends, the bookends for the Great Commission are presented here in Matthew 28. All power, pasa exousia, executive power is given unto me. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Which part of the Great Commission will you be most prone to? To forget. Please make Christ's authority your priority. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's been a privilege for Mary and I simply to review and convey the privilege that we have to come alongside your God called Baptist World Mission servants. Award. Oh May each one that we spoke about tonight, may Mary and I, may everyone who comprises this wonderful body at Calvary, make Christ's authority our priority. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Pat and Mary, for sharing your heart with what the Lord has done. And uh, for our holding the hands up of uh, so many missionaries and the opportunity that we have. We may not be able to go to those places, and uh, maybe the Lord could uh, take that, but uh, it's great to be able to see that and then be challenged with what we should do uh, right across the street, around the corner, at work, at school this week. All right, go in the peace of the Lord. God bless you, and have a great week.